All right. So really interesting discussion in terms of uh, uh, how or what it is. You know, the what are the limits between a uh, lender and a borrower in terms of uh, ribit? So here it's not a function of. Uh, I'll give you a thousand dollars. You'll give me back twelve hundred, or I'll give you, uh, you know, a bushel of wheat, and I expect you to pay me back a bushel and a half, etc. That seems pretty clearly a sur uh, biblically speaking. We mentioned the heter iska, which is basically that you can, um, you can, you can lend someone money in such a way that you become uh, an equity partner in the business, and that you're entitled to a certain uh, return. Although it might have qualified, and we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, now, uh, is what we call mehazei kiribit. It looks like ribit. Mehazei. Learn this in Aramaic. The Ashkenazim call it mehazei. Mehazei in Aramaic is a reflexive verb, meaning like it makes itself look like. So mehazei kiribit means it looks like ribit. It appears to us that what you're doing is ribit, meaning it's not that. So how would I know on the outside if I lent money to uh, to Yohan? And Yohan comes back to me at the end of the month and he says, oh, don't ask, the business took off, this uh, app that I created became a huge uh, money generator, and so you lent me a million dollars and here's, here's a million and a quarter back. So how does Adam, who sees us from the side, say, Rabbi, I thought we were friends, I mean, you told me you were orthodox, this is open orthodoxy, is that it? <laughs> so like, wh- where do you get off, taking more money than you gave him? And I say, no, you don't understand, we had a deal, it was an equity thing, I was a partner, but a silent investor, he's got the computer knowledge, I've got tons of cash. But if I failed... I would have given you, for example, uh, only seventy-five uh, hundred. Well, we could creatively come up with such a uh, a contract in which a certain proportion of the proceeds are a straight loan that I can um, I would go interest. force you into, uh, let's say, pawning, you know, or selling your uh, your belongings uh, that right that are not subject to any uh, business interest or any uh, equity, and then a certain proportion of it entitles me to a certain portion of it. That's exactly what I showed you. Oh, I didn't show you in the end the uh, the, Tariska, the one that you got. Uh, I don't think you showed it. I, I'm sorry. I, oh, I know what I meant to do. I meant to call him and ask him if I have permission from him to forward it to you guys. And I haven't spoken to him since then. He hasn't ordered any shakras. I'll call him up uh, tomorrow. I'll, I'll email him tomorrow ask him if I can do that. So I want you to see the way uh, halakhically, practically halakhically it's done today. That It's just that. It's, it's that the loan is actually divided into two portions. If we're both partners in a business, the business rises, it rises, it fails, it fails, you don't owe me anything. Ah, but if that's the case, then it all becomes pure venture capital, and I have no way of recovering my investment. So what we're going to do is I'm going to make uh, the loan in two uh, portions. One portion of it, maybe we'll call it the principal, you know, is, uh, is a straight up, well, it's not supposed to be that way, it's really supposed to be 50-50, but uh, originally it was conceived such that half of the loan would be considered uh, a secured loan, which means it's secured against any assets that you have or equity that you own in hard assets, if it's if you own a farm or a property or a house or a boat or a car, etc., uh, I can collect against them, uh, or I can make you sell them, or I can make you rent them out, or, you know, whatever, in order to recover my uh, my principal. And the interest, quote-unquote, would, would not be payable if the entire business uh, failed. But if the business succeeded, I would expect to get back up to a certain percentage, up to a certain uh, flat sum, you know, something like that. So today, this is just a, a, a long detour on how we permit loans that actually have what looks like interest on the outside, even though it's not really so... Okay, it's like selling your chametz. It's, it's a valid contract. It works. You can sit there looking at your chametz. 30 seconds ago, it belonged to you. After 30 seconds, it belonged to some Jamaican woman you're never going to meet. And it's fine. It, you know, it's valid and it, and it works. She wants it. She can come get it. I gave her my key. I gave her my number. She has my cell phone. She has my email. Like it's, it belongs to her. I'm just watching it for her. That's, that's all I'm doing. Um, there's another angle of all of this, which say, okay, so fine, so we permitted the, uh, the heter iska. One way or the other. And this is true even if you did use a heter iska, because at the end of the day, you're going to have to consider at least a certain portion of the loan to be a straight traditional loan. There are certain behaviors that Hazal didn't want people engaging in uh, when someone owes you money. Okay? The reference, mi as lo tihelo kenoshe. Don't be like a creditor to this person. Meaning, don't run around saying... You owe me money, pay me back. When are you going to pay me back? You pay me back, and I pay me back. So, okay, so we should be making loans with contracts and with witnesses. I lent you $1,000. You'll pay me back $1,000. If not today, 30 days, 60, 90, whatever it is. But hopefully, eventually, it'll get paid. I don't need these constant reminders. I don't need to harass you. I don't have the right to take advantage of you. In fact, it appears in the context of the interdiction to oppress converts, the interdiction to mistreat uh, orphans and widows. You're, you're pretty helpless when you have to borrow money and you have nowhere else to get it. So if you came to me and you asked to borrow the money, I would say, look, I'll give it to you. 
I don't need to remind you or harass you or humiliate you. So fine, I, I read the Torah, even someone, you know, let's say reform and up could tell you that's what the Pasuk means, I shouldn't oppress you. But what happens when it comes to certain things like favors, right? Am I entitled to ask you certain favors? If the favor that I'm going to ask you is going to be interpreted by people as, you know, an, another way of me taking advantage of you without taking advantage of you, or because you have the lower hand in the uh, relationship, you're the weaker party, uh, effectively I'm getting extra goods and services from you in return for having made you the loan, which, as Chazal said, is pretty much tantamount to ribit. If it's not ribit, it's close enough to warrant uh, exclusion from our uh, vocabulary. So there are a couple of, uh, of examples. Um, what happens if this is a sticky one? Uh, let's say uh, Manuela Sorani happens to own a car dealership, and so he sells and leases cars. Well, because he owns a car dealership, I assume he makes a ton of money. He sells Italian cars. And I come to him and I say, Manuela, I have a business I'm looking to expand, and I need $50,000. So sure, $50,000 is not a problem. I'm okay. I don't even need a hetericha. It's a straight, you know, middle right loan. I'll lend you the money. I have Adam Paul Roven and David Sasson, who is also Italian and therefore should be testifying. But he is. And he says, you know what? No problem. We signed the contract. Elkin owes Sorani $50,000. And then I turn around and said, you know what, Manuela, I could actually use a company car. You know, and what would be a more fitting company car for a rabbi than a Lamborghini? How about, you know, uh, I I, uh, I take this Lamborghini. So you can say, look, I already lent the guy the money, and now he's looking to lease the car from me. So I don't know if I'm going to get the money back. I don't know if I'm going to get all the money back. I don't know when I'm going to get the money back. Maybe I can make a little extra something on it and say, you know, blame his credit score. <laughs> and I could say to him, so I'll, I'll lease it to him for a little bit more than I normally would, and then where's he going to go? To somebody else? You think I would sit there and watch him lease a car from someone else? The money that I should be making on one of my cars is going to give it to somebody else. So you basically have me in a, in a corner. You know, I can't really get out. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? Things like this we try to be very careful about. Uh, if you needed help with something, if you, you know, were painting your house and you wanted somebody else to... But Rabbi, would be case, the same case if he would have forfeited the loan? Let's say he said, you don't know why, you don't owe me any money, and you still want to rent a car from you. Would, would we see that you rent the car from you in any way, like a sort of payment, even if he didn't actually ask you for payment? Technically. Technically. If there was an official act of forfeiture, so what does that mean? If I have a contract that says, you know, I owe Emmanuel $50,000, I pass the due date. I'm not exempt from paying him. I mean, I may not pay him interest. But you say he just for free loan, you know. So what does that mean? If he tells me, listen, you know, I realize that this loan is not going to be repaid, or I realize that the money's tied up, I realize that if I collect the loan now, then you're out of business, whatever it is. So he could officially write such a thing. I mean, you would do this in front of a big deal. You would say, I have a loan out to so-and-so. And the money is considered, uh, at this point, a gift. It's a matana Correct. Once the lender-borrower relationship is dissolved, technically, mm -hmm. you're not forbidden from doing business with each other. I mean, uh, and it depends how it ends. Uh, I've had the good fortune of borrowing money from a number of people over the course of uh, my 37 years. I mean, normally, you, 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 things end amicably, and you try to stay in good uh, relations with people. And sometimes... Uh, people within, let's say, the same industry would be happy to help you because you can also make use of it after. Uh, I, I see this in, in food service and, uh, and farming all the time. You know, farmers aren't necessarily competitors with each other. It could be that I, you were stuck and you had a certain number of lambs you wanted to sell and you, you were short. So I gave you some of mine, but I expect payment back. And it could be that you paid it back in some other way. So it becomes very complicated when, uh, you know, if, if there was an official act of forfeiture and there is no longer a relationship between a lender and a borrower here, probably, hashkafically speaking, like philosophically speaking, it might depend on the relationship. If we're perfectly happy, it's okay. You let me three lambs because I had to fill an order of 100. And, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's not a big deal. It's one thing. If he gave me 300 lambs, and that's like all he had for the year, and it was to help me not pass up on a big offer that I had, and whatever. So, you know, you don't want to make it uh, super complicated. If the guy doesn't care, and he's totally mochel, and he forgives you, fine. What's the problem here? The problem here is the, there's a pasuk in Mishlei, the Gemara quotes in Masechet Baba Metziah, 
Shlomo Melech tells you, don't eat the bread of someone whose eyes uh, wince at it. You know, to wince in English is like to make this painful expression. So, you know, uh, David and Abigail Levi have been super generous, and they've, they've invited me to their house uh, ten times for a Shabbat lunch on the course of the past year. And they know that I can't really afford it, but I say to them, you know what, God, why don't you come to my house for Shabbat this next week? You know, it'd be great. I say, wait a second, what do you mean? I know that uh, your wife has been sick and that your grandmother needs uh, help. And, you know, like, eh, for whatever reason, financially, the business hasn't been so great. You know that maybe I'm not able to, uh, to afford it. But I tell you anyway. So the Gemara compares accepting an offer that wasn't really made uh, in earnest to theft. You know, Lechem Tzara, it's like, I'm almost stealing from you. It could be that in order to meet a certain social obligation, you know, I invited you just so it shouldn't sound like I never invite you because I'm embarrassed. I come to your house all the time and then you never come to me. It's not fair. So I might say something because I feel obligated to, but if you come to my house and you drink my best whiskey and you, you know, you know, eat my best uh, cheeses, etc., then maybe you're going to say, uh, you know, uh, good, we're glad it worked out. Maybe he didn't have the money. It's about time he should pay us back all the times that we spent money on him. That's where it gets complicated. If someone really forfeits and he gives up and he doesn't care and he's totally mochel and he totally forgives, I'd say fine. Eventually, over time, you go back to normal relation. We went to a restaurant. You paid one time. I paid the next time. I mean, that's how you try to work it out. If someone actually owes you, it becomes a lot more uh, complicated. You can naturally ask for favors that this person's not going to turn down. You could actually end up incurring a loss, right? Uh, you can say, look, uh, if it's no big deal, I just need a little bit of help uh, with my car. I have to, you know, we have to tow it. I got stuck in the snow, whatever. What am I going to say? No. I owe you money, I feel bad, I mean, I have to work in order to pay it back. You might cost me half a day of work, and then you might even, you know, damage my ability to pay you back uh, on time. But you put me in a position where I can't tell you, look, I, I don't want to do this, or please find somebody else, or, or I'll pay you to find somebody else, just I have to get this thing done. So if I can afford it, great. If I can't, it becomes uh, an issue. What if you're buying or selling something? You know? I might naturally feel bad and say, look... Uh, don't have the money just yet, but maybe uh, if you sell uh, windows, you know, I'll buy a few just to kind of uh, make you feel a little bit better about not getting your money back on time. So it, it becomes complicated. What if I'm the only guy who sells windows in the entire town? Is it technically a suitor for me to buy windows? Like, my windows are broken. I can't replace them because I owe money to the same guy who produces them. I mean, it gets a little bit uh, subjective. But this is why it's... it's like you don't, you don't want to make it look like you're taking advantage of somebody... Uh, because uh, he owes you uh, he owes you money. The opposite, though, what happens if I sell windows, I lend you money out of uh, Rahmanul, it's like, mercy, I know that you need the money, but you can't make ends meet. I lend you money in order to get your business going. I see that it's not going so well. You know, is there any issue with me giving you windows, or giving you a better price than I would give to somebody else? I mean, probably not, as long as that person wouldn't be uh, offended by it or, or take offense to it. You know, you'd... you'd just because we have this kind of relation doesn't mean... The problem would be what happens if I'm expected to reciprocate. Right. So you came to my house for Shabbat and you bought me a big, beautiful window because you manufacture them, of course. Why, well, who wouldn't want a window? So now I feel bad and I feel like I have to give you uh, one of my horses because, of course, why not? You know, Reciprocate gifts. But I can't afford it. You're putting me in a position where you're basically making me feel bad and, and I'm going to try to come up with something that I can't. Could you go to a court and sue me for this? You know, could I go to a bid dean and say, you know, it's not fair. He came to my house, he gave me a window. Bastard, I have to <laughs> find a way to get back at him. I mean, come on, did something nice, he gave you a gift. But gifts come with uh, strings attached. You know, people uh, in, in social situations have expectations. I'll give you an example of this. Um, the Gemara says, well, a number of things. Number one, uh, Rashi proves from the Gemara that it's a sur to give someone um, a gift and not tell him or her. Right? And apparently he's talking about a purely social situation, not like tzedakah. I want to give you help. Maybe it's better that I should give it to you in such a way that you don't know who I am, and it would be better even if I didn't know who you were. That's something else. If I'm giving you a gift, and, uh, and a, like an official... Uh, again, it'd be a funny example, but let's say I'm, uh, I'm uh, I don't know, going to Adam's house for, uh, for Shabbat, and I, uh, I buy him a bouquet of uh, flowers. So... The appropriate thing to do would be to say, you know, I got you this for, uh, thank you for inviting me, etc., for Shabbat, whatever it is. I don't want anybody to feel bad. Don't buy me anything. We're fine. We invite people all the time. And I, I, for this reason specifically, I want anybody to feel like I'm breaking the bank. Every time he invites me, I have to buy him something. And I feel bad. No, 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 don't buy anything. But would that it were, 
and um, go into someone's house for Shabbat and I want to let them know that I got them something. There are societal expectations. Now Rashi says if you're giving somebody a gift, unless it's tzedakah, you should let them know. Why, how it works out this way, just apparently at least that was the expectation at the time. I'll give you a better example of this. The Gemara says that people used to give uh, shush binut. When you were marrying off a son or a daughter, you would, you would give people gifts and they were expected to reciprocate. So when Dawid's daughter was getting married, uh, I decided, of course, why not? You know, I'm the Lamborghini salesman, so what would be more fitting than to give her a, a lease for a year? Give her a gift, what am I crazy? A lease, a lease for a year. So when my daughter gets married, he's likely to want to be able to reciprocate. Does that mean it's a sore for me to give a really fancy gift to someone who's not able to do the same thing for me? It's a good question. It's a very good and tactful question to ask. Because if I put you in a situation where you feel bad and you feel like you owe me, we came right back to where we started, I'm taking advantage of you and the fact that you're you know, unable to. Either I'm showing off and I'm saying, look what a gift I can give you. And you know, I'll be lucky if I get a bottle of wine out of you when my daughter gets married. <laughs> yeah, but if, if tomorrow I get, uh, I get the lottery... Uh, back to our discussion last week, I didn't obviously. Right. Um, so uh, and I you don't know how many people I've have got tagged on Facebook and people sent me text messages asking me if it's halakhically permissible. Or anyway, my so, my line should have been yes, it's permissible. Actually, first of all, we did get did you get we did get a donation last week? No. Yes, thirty two dollars or something exactly. And it went through. He, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 one guy asked me and I said you can buy as many tickets as you want as long as you give the exact same amount of money to the bit and he did it. He's like, okay, I'll do it. Fine, no problem. <laughs> that was... That's exactly what. <laughs> <laughs> you, came, you walked in late on the conversation. Yeah, I thought it was very honest. Uh, no, no, I thought it was right, aggressive, right, but I'm right. glad I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been doing this for years. Yeah, right? I, saw, I, saw, I saw the email with the donation. It's so weird. Why he's... He didn't say what it was for? No. But he should have tagged me on it. I should get a commission. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but I like, but, I like the idea. Like, I mean, the people ask it. These or uh, even, let's forget the lottery for once. Uh, you... I, I get my app thanks to the loan that you gave me. Oh, he called me with a halachic question afterwards, and I was sure he was one of the winners. I was like, don't tell me. I was telling everybody not to do this. It's crazy. It's stupid. It's a waste of money. Like, and he comes. Anyway, it was fun. So, I was the answer the phone. I was like, I wanted to hear the, the voice message first and calm down. I said, okay, it's just this. I'll call him back. So I make my app. I have a lot of money, huh. and I see someone who's inviting me to his uh, wedding because he's been a friend for a long time, even before I had money. And uh, I know that uh, when my kids get married, he's not going to be able to give me a lot of a big gift, but I'm like, I'm gonna look like a moron if I give him a, like a so, small stuff. You know? So be tactful, be tactful. Try to do something that. Uh, so I haven't made my. I'll, give you, yet, I'll give you a couple of examples. Right, you're working on it. But, so here's a couple of examples I can give you. Number one is that uh, maybe if you work in a particular industry and there's something you can do that's um, where the value of the product isn't really reflected. You know, maybe it's not as big a deal or like you won't expect them to do something as precise so for example if i happen to sell computers okay no offense to anyone who lives in the computer industry but if i happen to sell computers maybe the retail price of a computer a good desktop with uh again microsoft virus uh enabled and all the other uh goods and services that microsoft uh, forces you into so if I uh, get a desktop, let's say for, uh, I don't know, uh, $1,100, $1,200, at the top of the line, fanciest, whatever, it still has a CD-ROM drive on it, I mean, one of the best of it. So if it retails at a certain manufacturer, retail suggested price, then you'd say, okay, uh, if I had to go buy one, it would cost me $1,100. If I know that you sell these things for a living, and maybe there's a certain margin on them, and for all I know, I don't know, 50%, uh, you mark it up because of whatever your other expenses are, so it's worth to me more than it's worth to you, you know? And uh, if you're an eye doctor, I don't know how helpful that is. a free coupon to a pair of glasses <laughs> that I'll need in another 20 years after I'm married. But, right, so that might, uh, might work. I didn't know this, by the way. I mean, I thought it was a very antiquated concept. Until after we got married, my father-in-law very politely, he's Libyan, so very politely, he requested a detailed list of all the people who gave us gifts and how much they gave. Oh yeah, they do that all the time. It drives me crazy. Really, the Libyans do. Come, tell me more about Libyan culture. Can I write my hands? Can you say it again to your father-in-law? My father-in-law, and this is right out of the Gemara. My father-in-law says to me, "Well, it's Tunisian. It's the same thing." Ask him. He came and he says to me, "I want a list of everybody who came on my side of the. Did you what your parents gave you? Everybody on my side of the of the the family or the friends that came, 
tell me exactly how much they gave because I'm going to give them the same thing. And I said, well, first of all, you're the IRS. Like, <laughs> you want to know what these people are? Maybe he had a bad year. I don't know. You think he's a lawyer. He has a practice. All of a sudden, he gives you. And if somebody else, you thought he was poor, he gave me a ton. I don't know. So, uh, Actually, you just brought up a good point, though. Uh, all, all of these halachot uh, assume financial transparency. You don't always know what someone else makes. It could be completely not what the appearance right. is. You don't. The question is, you know, what chances are worth taking? Just tonight, here, you might, I'm sorry to catch your name. Uh, David. David. Nice to meet you, David. How are you done? Uh, my attorney calls me up tonight. I, I used to have another attorney, and I don't like him because he wasn't responsive, so I got another attorney. And uh, he was part of a practice. He calls me up tonight, and I thought it was because he, he wrote a contract for me and I had to pay him whatever. So I said, oh, you know, I know I didn't I'll cut, your, I'll cut your check next week. I have something clearing. So he said, fine, no problem. That's not why I called you. I said, why did you call me? He said, I called you to tell you that I just left that practice and I moved to another practice. And this is a guy that I talk to three times, four times a year when I need something. I said to myself, oh, okay. So he moved to other practice. And right away I said, you know, the last bill was under the firm and I have to pay them. That's a legal thing. And I said to myself, this is a good thing. It's a bad thing. Is it amicable or is it, you know, contentious? So I, I almost didn't know how to approach it. And I said, well, I hope this is a, a, a successful year for you. It should work out well and, you know, that everything progresses uh, amicably. But I couldn't tell if and now he's making more money, he's making less. Is it... He's not paying as much to the firm, so he's keeping more for himself. He just lost a bunch of clients. Like you, you really sometimes really don't know. The idea is that you try not to take uh, excessive chances on things. So if you assume that someone works in a particular industry, and by the way, people give different gifts based on how close they feel you are, right? Here's a better question for you. <laughs> you lent me $100,000. Next month, your daughter's getting married. I'm not going to give you a gift. I know exactly how much I would have given you if I didn't borrow the money. I mean... It gets complicated, but the idea is that you don't want to make it, you know, something too big or too small. Uh, I can make the gift later. I can I can find another way uh, around it. Um, you don't know what people are making. You sometimes don't know how much they appreciate the relationship until you actually get a gift. You say either I'm blown away, I had no idea, or like that's what you think of me. <laughs> I thought we were friends. So people are, are kind of uh, funny that way. I think the bottom line is that you don't want to be the impetus behind the financial decision. You want to give me something for my uh, daughter's bat mitzvah? Pff, whatever you want. 100%, we'll stay friends. You don't want to give me anything, so great, fine, we'll stay friends. I'm not offended, I'm not insulted. Uh, I don't want either my position over you because I you owe me money and you're disadvantaged, or the money that I gave you to be held over your head and to force you into a decision that you otherwise wouldn't have made. I don't want to be taking advantage of you. I don't want to be asking you... Uh, for favors, to help me move in, to help me move out, to help me paint the apartment, um, to give me rides to certain places. And again, rides to where? If uh, Adam, who's been lending me money for the last uh, half hour, if uh, if he knew that... Uh, There's not much right now. <laughs> There's not much right now. <laughs> well, a very funny commentary. I once heard there was uh, one of the playoff games in the NHL. I was young, I was still watching this thing. And uh, this one guy got absolutely clobbered. I mean, he got hit really hard. And it took him a while to get up. <laughs> and so the commentators are running out of time. They have to, you know, they're waiting for this guy to basically someone come help him off the ice. And the guy's like, uh, well, you know, he's playing a really solid game, this guy. And in fact, he had two assists. He's like, the other guy comes in, he says, I bet you you can't remember either one of them right now. <laughs> he doesn't know where he is, this guy. He's to be helped and picked up. So, so if, um, you know, if you know that I'm going anyway to work, I don't know if it's that big a deal. Like, I go to Hackensack every day. Tell the rabbi, I need to ride to Hackensack. Okay, ride to Hackensack is fine. Tell the rabbi, I need to ride to Philadelphia. <laughs> There's only so much, uh, so much I can do. But uh, situations like this have uh, arisen in the past. Uh, I'll give you a funny example. One of the guys who lent me some money in order to help me start my business was somebody that we used to invite over for Shabbat meals every so often. Uh, and when he first stumbled on this uh, halakha, this is, by the way, Siman Puf uh, Pewa, 186 in the Torah uh, which is exactly what my daughter's uh, passport cost me today at the post office. <laughs> so, like 86 and 91. so yeah, he, he said to me, I don't know if I should be eating at your house anymore for, uh, for Shabbat because uh, I lent you the money and when you pay me back, you know, we can go back to uh, how things were. But I, I want it to be like I'm taking advantage of you now. And I said, okay, fine, I hear that. But why can't we at least go back to the original uh, dosage? Like if we had you over, let's say, four times a year, we're good for once a season, once a fiscal quarter. How about we just keep it that way? I don't want it to be because you lent me money that I'm not inviting you at all. I don't want it to be like you're coming every day and eating me out of house and home to get your money back in Schena. Uh, maybe we can <laughs> we can work it out such that uh, at least with the same frequency that it was before, it is now, and we can just assume everybody's going to be 
more or less uh, taken care of. So, so it, it is very subjective. At the end of the day, relationships with people are always subjective. Kosh has a sense of humor. He created mothers-in-law for a reason. It's just, you know, you try to, to tread lightly when it comes to these things. <laughs> but what about um, employment relationships? So let's say I work for Adam, let's say. Right. And we all do. And, um, you know, one day he, he asked me if I can invite him for Shabbat. Mm -hmm. So I only have a working relationship with him, but he happened to me that I invited him for Shabbat, and he knows that I'm not going to say no because at the end of the day he's my boss, so right. I'm not going to say no to him. I'm gonna, uh, but maybe that's not exactly the person I want to have over on Shabbat. Uh, so we don't you you ever get invited to a company party? Yeah, you're right. So those are so how is that gonna be also considered a sort of from his side taking advantage of the fact that we have a sort of that I owe him something because I work for him? Right. So well, the more problematic side of it is not that he's inviting you, so you work for him and he invites you. No, no, that I invite him. Oh, you you invite I, him. I work for him. He's my right. boss. He's your he, boss. And I, and he wants to be invited. He okay. asked me. I don't know so to maybe go. you're trying to make a more. Uh, I'm just. It, it depends on the intentions. Maybe you're trying to break the ice, you're trying to create a more peaceful uh, work environment, you're trying to um, show a certain side of yourself that doesn't come out when you're working, it doesn't come out in your work, etc. Uh, there are ethical questions about this, you know, uh, if you get advantaged this way or disadvantaged, and what happens to other people in the firm who don't have the ability to do the same, but every people are also, you know, we're social too. People meet each other at work and it's an important part of our social lives. The, the question is a, is a little bit more complicated. Like, if he feels that he pays you, so he knows how much you make, and he says, look, this guy put out a spread, I just can't believe he did this. Uh, so either you're trying to bribe him, or you're trying to, uh, you know, to be nice and friendly, but you might put him in a position where he has to do the same. And by the way, it could be that he works on commission. You might work on straight salary, and he might depend on, you know, the outcome of your work and everybody else working under him, so... Uh, it's not. It's not so uh, so simple. I think the 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 rule, the golden rule, would be just don't go overboard. You know. Uh, it's it's a good it's a good practice to be in. Like people come, I used to tell my wife the same thing. If if you polish every corner of the house every time someone comes over, they're all going to get the impression the house is always permanently polished. You know, like everything was never touched and never used. It's setting a very high bar. It's difficult to be there all the time when you have kids doing unpredictable uh, things. So I don't want to make it look like I, I put on, you know, a thousand dollar Shabbat lunches because what I can do for you this week, I maybe can't do for the other guy the next week. So keep it reasonable. Stay within your means. Don't go out of your way, you know, in trying to uh, to impress him. And, he's, and bear in mind, he's, he's, he's saying double. He's saying. Oh, he's, so he's your boss. He should not. He's, he's saying good. if he, he wants to be invited. Oh, he invites himself over yeah, to your house. Yeah, he wants to be invited. So, so, that, invited. so that would be a classic example of Lechem Sarai. First of all, he's your boss. Maybe you don't like him. Well, they, uh, you have to land on him like a mother-in-law. I mean, no offense to mother-in-law. Uh, maybe he doesn't, uh, you know, maybe you don't like him, but you're in a position that you can't refuse. That would be the definition of Lechem Sarai. If that's what, you're, what you meant, right. So making an offer that you can't refuse is a, is a traditionally Italian uh, proposition. <laughs> uh <laughs> Right, ask uh, Robert De Niro and, uh, and company. So that's that's a classic example of a situation where you really have to be careful about this. According to the Pasuk in Mishle, like someone who has Yerat Shemaim tries to avoid situations like that. Why would, I, why would I burden you with me, especially knowing that I've got power over you and I can use my influence over you and I can push you in a, in a certain direction? So if you guys were friends before you started working together, if he opened the company and he just took you on board because he knew you from some other place, okay, so like I said, do you all of a sudden stop talking to him or you, you end the social relationship because you got into a business relationship? I mean, the more I work in business, the more I see that these things are just very much dependent on, on the relationships that people have and your social skills are important. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't try to use these things to manipulate, you know, too many situations, but you have business lunches, you have business dinners, etc. I happen to know people and certain people with expense accounts. I could tell by the way they order things. <laughs> it's like, the guy's got money in his account at the end of the month, and so just, you know, waste it. Why not? But uh, you have to be careful about situations like that. If you can use something over someone else and then expect favors in return, that's another aspect of it. Tobat hana'a, by the way, is a term that there's, there's no siman on it in the Shulchan Aruch, but it's a halachic concept. So uh, hana'a is benefit, and tovat hana'a is like the... Uh, a beneficial favor. And the classic example of this, the Gemara tells you, you have to remember ma'asar that you have to give, right? And let's presume, so David here, you're a Kohen or a Levi? Well, well, now you are. So David's a Kohen, 
and I have to give Maaser. Now, I can give it to him, or I can give it to Adam, who's also a Kohen. He just uh, works very hard during the day. So if, uh, if I give the money to David, and I know that uh, you know, he works in, uh, in wine bottling, I figure that maybe if I give him enough uh, Maaser, Truma business during the year, Maybe I'm good for a bottle of the wine, uh, wine around uh, Rosh Hashanah. You know, you gotta, you gotta kiss the hand that feeds you. I mean, uh, if I if I give the bottle to Adam and Adam works in a bakery, uh, okay, you know, a loaf of bread isn't a bottle of wine. So the Gemara says, yes, technically you have the power of Tovatana. True, you have to give it to Rama Aser or to a Kohen, just like you have to give it to the Kata, somebody who's poor. Who do you give it to? So if uh, five people come knocking on our door, every guy Levi says, look, I can give money to any one of you. This guy's Tunisian, so well, I'm going to refuse him. I can give it to somebody else. But, you know, uh, the, 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 you have the right to decide who you're going to give the money to, even though there are certain, call them benefits, or certain advantages that might uh, carry. The Torah can't prevent you from giving to one person or another. Is it a bigger mitzvah to give it to the Kohen who's a jerk? I don't know. I mean, I think there's something to be said for there being a reciprocal relationship where you know, Kohen prays for you who does Avodah cares about you even when he's not a Beit HaMikdash it's the kind of person I want to support but at the end of the day it's my decision it's my Turumah it's my Ma'as it doesn't belong to a specific Kohen it's, it's kind of owned and kind of not by all of the Kohanim until I decide who's going to get it there's a whole Sugiyah on the Gemara if a Kohen comes and steals it from me do I have the Halachic authority to take it away from him and the one claim I can make is, no, there's a Kohen that I like to support. He lives in my neighborhood, and if I don't give him, nobody else will. And maybe that's, uh, that's grounds for, uh, you know, for making a tort law claim against him. But, but you, he wouldn't be stealing it from you. He'd be stealing it from the other Kohen in that case. Right, which is another thing the Gemara talks about. It's going to be, I don't have a right against him. Another Kohen could say, wait a second, yeah, you've been giving me this about for 20 years. All of a sudden, you're going to jump in and take it? You know, and, and once he took it, does that fulfill my obligation of giving it? Is the obligation actually to give it? Uh, but anyway, when it comes to, uh, to Rimit, Chazal used these examples. Uh, purchasing, not to purchase things cheaper, more expensive, just because there's a lender-borrower relationship between us. Uh, not to uh, rent things for more or less money, not to demand favors or expect somebody to go out of their way uh, for you. Um, and I guess, in a way, uh, the, the last thing I would say on this topic is that you have to be careful when you get financially involved with people. See, somebody needs to the guy, he needs a favor, okay, fine, give it to him. But there's just as big a mitzvah to lend money as there is to give it as a gift. Just because uh, I'm poor and I have nothing to eat doesn't mean you have to give away your money. You can say, fine, I can give you $200, but I need 100 back. i got to make my rent at the end of the month, and I just can't if you don't pay me back. So there's nothing wrong with lending people money. It's not that you, there is a mitzvah that if your brother or sister needs money, you can lend it to them. And you've done a tremendous thing. If you can afford to give it away, maybe it's a little bit better, but no complaints to someone who needs the money and uh, beggars can't be choosers. So, you know, you don't want to hesitate. You don't want to uh, prevent yourself from doing good or doing mitzvah where you can. One of the things you have to consider is that it does have the capacity to change relationships. I don't know if any of you know anybody who, let's say, family got involved in business, which is a great way to destroy both. But if you, for whatever crazy reason decided that you're not Syrian enough and you really want to try to get your family uh, inextricably involved in your financial and social life, uh, you can go ahead and push for such a thing. But it changes the way your relationship works. You don't need to borrow or lend something. You don't need to buy or sell something. You don't need to rent something or have it rented out or demand a favor to know. Some people have a certain presence. <laughs> like if it's my father-in-law who lent me the money to start my business, he'll find a way to let me know. He'll remind me. He'll be <laughs> in such a... You'll put it in such a way that it's hard for me to, uh, you know, not help him when he needs the help, or not to remind me when uh, ever he the discussion comes up in a conversation. Of course, he's going to lend me the money. Absolutely, best bank in the world. So you have to be aware of the fact that there are um, unforeseen consequences uh, on your relationships with people when it comes to money. Easy enough when it's just an employer-employee situation. That's already complicated enough to work with someone that you know uh, and to be involved with them. But uh, when it comes to lending and borrowing. Uh, even with people that you don't know, and so much the more so people that you do, it becomes really difficult. I used to go to your house every other week for Shabbat lunch. We used to switch off, and now that you know this loan, I don't want to step on your toes, but I don't want to ignore you. It, there's like this weirdness between us. It's a little bit bizarre. But so it happens. You have to be careful. Whatever it is, just uh, do it with the right intention, and maybe you can talk about it sometimes too. It also helps to uh, lubricate the uh, the bizarre social situations. So, so next week with God's help, we'll talk uh, about uh, open orthodoxy. 
Uh, it really is a worthwhile conversation. And then 